So hello and welcome to the final webinar in our series, Understanding Your Trees, Tree Species Selection and Resilience. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar will be recorded and available afterwards. Uh, if the audience could remain muted and their cameras off, that would be most appreciated. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. If you see a question in the chat that you would like answered, or you've got the same question, uh, select the thumbs up emoji on that question and we'll go through the most popular questions at the session at the end. So today we'll be covering Tree Health by John Manning, Woodland Management for Resilience by John Burgess, and Tree Health Grants by Beth and Walk and Emma Strong. And I will hand over to you, John Manning. Thanks, Pollyanna. Hi, everyone. I'm John Manning. I'm a uh, uh, plant health officer based in the southwest. My role uh, revolves around um, surveying uh, for pests and diseases and also managing for pests and diseases, um, specifically in the southwest, but um, uh, I also cover um, other areas of the country when, um, when uh, help is needed. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Phytophthora morum. Um, I'm going to look at drought uh, and I'm going to sh show you a snapshot of the stuff that we do in plant health to um, uh, to, to help our trees, basically. Um, so I'll I'll start off by sharing my screen. OK, hopefully that can be that's all seen. Thank you. OK, so. So Phytophthora morum is uh, is still a major part of our work, and um, and it's it's one of the most um, threatening organisms to 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 our environment. That's because it can infect over 150 different uh, species. So it's not spe host specific. It um, it's quite generalist in in that respect. Um, it is a quarantine organism um, because of the damage that it causes, the broad range range of hosts that it infects, and its ability to jump uh, species and habitats. Um, it first emerged in the early 2000s on infected ornamental plants, and then in 2009 we found the first finding on, on larch in the southwest. Aerial surveys uh, started after that in 2010. Uh, that found further infection in the southwest, uh, then into Wales, and we found infection later on in Northern Ireland and Scotland. So what is Phytophthora? Well, Phytophthora the name means plant destroyer and these are fungus like plant pathogens known as water molds they move about in moisture um, that can be atmospheric or, or soil moisture and there's two broad uh, groups of phytophthora these aren't mutually exclusive but these can be sort of soil borne um, phytophthora that attack the roots um, and aerial borne that can attack from the canopies of trees and plants Remorum is an aerial Phytophthora. Uh, you may have heard of Phytophthora pluvialis that have been uh, affecting um, a western hemlock in the southwest um, a, a, and in the, the, the northwest. Uh, pluvialis is, is an aerial born Phytophthora, although there may also be a soil born um, part of that. And then you've got Phytophthora lateralis. Um, this is a soil born pathogen. Uh, but it also has an aerial phase to it. Uh, Phytophthora lateralis has been um, uh, very significant in uh, decimating Lawson cypress in, in America. The photo here shows, really shows the suitability of Phytophthora in the southwest. This, this is a picture taken in Cornwall. It shows a deep forest valley that is wet and has high atmospheric moisture. And this is conducive to the movement of Phytophthora spores. It has a mild temp. It, it, uh, it, um, it, it, sorry, the site is also quite mild in its temperature, which Phytophthora remorum performs best in because exposure to hot and dry conditions appear capable of significantly reducing Phytophthora remorum uh, populations. In this uh, 
Forest Valley here. There's um, we found Phytophthora morum, Phytophthora pluvialis, and Phytophthora lateralis. Uh, so it really shows um, the suitability of, of some of these environments that we find in the southwest and, of course, in Wales, um, in the northwest, in the Lake District and in Scotland. Uh, we've also found Phytophthora canovii in Cornwall, uh, and that's a pathogen of beech and rhododendron, among others. So very favourable habitat here for Phytophthoras. This, uh, the map on the right here is a suitability map of Phytophthora morum in the UK. This was created by American scientists in the early 2000s, and it's pretty accurate as our findings match this rather well. The, you may not clearly be able to see it, but the yellow dots are targets, target sites um, that we surveyed in 2022. The red squares are 2021 findings. Um, and you can see there there's actually a spread to the northeast and York Moors. It's not as favourable climatically, but there is an abundance of larch there, which is an issue. Uh, and the blue and grey colours are findings going back to 2010. What's not shown is Wales, but it fits very well with the suitability map. So the previous three years we've experienced have been the worst uh, on record um, with the most widespread infection. Whilst Phytophthora morum has been present for some time, it really shows it's not stable and it can adapt to its environment. In 2021, it was one of the worst years we, we found. We had 573 cases, uh, of which 341 were confirmed positive for Phytophthora morum. The majority of those were actually in the northwest and northeast. Then in it, last year, um, again, we had a significant amount of um, of suspect sites. We had 374. Um, and with the positives, we had 224, but half of those positives were found in the southwest with 112 sites uh, found in Cornwall and Devon um, and Somerset. Then this year, the sites of infection have lowered significantly. Um, it's still ongoing, the survey season for Phytophthora, um, but we currently have 235 suspect sites, so quite a drop from the previous three years. Um, in the southwest, we've got 69 target sites and currently only 29 of those are positive for Phytophthora morum. The thought behind why this is um, declined so much uh, is possibly the summer drought that we had last year and the early drought uh, that we had this year. Because um, as I said, that the, uh, the Drought can uh, affect uh, Ramon's um, spread and in infection. It's um, um, it's uh, uh, potency or whatever. <laughs> um, but I, and so basically, the drought inhibits the growth and, and reproduction of of, of Ramorum. So just looking back to sort of last year, um, symptoms can be striking and widespread. In 2022, in the southwest, we found very widespread infection in Mid Devon, West Devon, North Devon, and Exmoor. Um, sweet chestnut. Here you can see that sort of the dotted trees there that are, that are dead. Um, that's all sweet chestnut. Um, so it's still a major host of Phytophthora morum, and we continue to find infected sites every year uh, of sweet chestnut that's mostly down in the southwest because that's where a lot of the sweet chestnut is in the in the southeast of the country where there there, there is more um sweet chestnut stands um because of it being uh, a different climate a drier climate um with phytophthora and morum doesn't have uh much of a foothold there uh, the symptoms on uh, sweet chestnut, um, here's just a couple here, but uh, you typically get on the epicormic growth, which is the stress response growth that trees or the sweet chestnut grow around the base of the tree. You get this die back and you can see the top left photo there it shows um, it, basically there's there's die back happening. There'll be a lesion there underneath the, the stem as well. And then on the leaf. Uh, you get this um, black watery staining on it, almost like an ink stain. Um, and that's typically found at the tip of the leaf um, because it's where the 
when it rains, the spores are in the in the droplets, they fall onto the leaf and then they sit there and then that's where the uh, remoran can start to infect. But we've seen high infection on other species as well. Lots of noble fir became infected, where in association with um, highly infected larch, as you can see here, the noble fir there, the, uh, the, uh, the healthy ones that show uh, more of a blue color, um, and you can see the infected ones there are uh, this very vibrant ginger colour. Now, noble fur is what we term a terminal host. Um, it can be infected by remorum and it can die from remorum. But what it what remorum can't do is reproduce off noble fur, as far as we've seen. Larch, on the other hand, and sweet chestnut are what we call sporulating hosts. So that they can be infected by remorum die from remorum, uh, but also remorum can reproduce from those hosts. So we saw the same in Devon with noble fur. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons that why we issue statutory plant health notice that require the felling of infected sporulating species. And it's to stop the disease jumping to other species. There, there is a real risk risk that as we remove more of the sporulating host species to manage the disease, Remoran could adapt to find a new sporulating host. So we really need to bring the spore levels down in the environment to, um, to stop that from happening as best we can. And this is in Northern Ireland. Um, it, that's a heavily infected large stand. Most of them are dead, um, but you can see the sort of two eyes on the hill there. That's um, that's noble fir. Um, this this is one of the worst sites we found um, for noble fir death last year. Um, and just a bit of background in Northern Ireland, in 2020 we found 50 to 100 hectares of infected larch and then in 21 um, we found over a thousand hectares of infection. So there was conducive factors that came together and the disease went from behaviour of, of an endemic to an epidemic. Uh, rhododendron, um, rhododendron in the wider environment is still a, a large threat for infection to take place and for spreading infection. And it's not just about trees. Vaccinium, bilberry is a host of remorum and Phytophthora canovii. Uh, where infection is in the larch on these sites, it can generally be seen on the bilberry symptoms. Um, uh, so it's seen on the bilberry and the symptoms include uh, dieback and necrosis and chlorosis in the leaves. Uh, this is a sporulating host, but sporulation is low, unlike in large. And then we have infection that can look like remorum. Um, and this includes Ipsembre, uh, which is the larch beetle. It's a relative of Ips topographus, the eight toothed spruce bark beetle that's affecting the Norway spruce in the southeast and in central Europe. Now, this is always thought to be a, a secondary pest infesting stress trees. Um, and in this situation, that could be the case due to the potential waterlogging here. However, in some areas where larch has been dying back due to Ipsembre, it's been difficult to see what the actual cause of the stress in the larch is. It's appearing that healthy trees are being attacked by the larch beetle. This is not a quarantine pest, but it is something to be aware of. Just moving on to the drought now, so the, the, the drought we had last summer and early this year has led to our surveys finding drought stress in larch and other tree species. This picture, which actually I've, I've sort of turned the, uh, I've enhanced it a bit so we can pick out the, the trees that are suffering with drought here. Um, this is a picture of drought stress larch in North Devon uh, taken last summer. And we can see the canopy turning brown and then, and it's the whole canopy rather than individual, individual branches, which suggests that it's not remorum. Also looking at the wider context, you can see the grass above is not a typical look for a lush Devon field but is very brown and drought stressed. Um, and a ground survey later on confirmed this to be drought damage on large. The Forestry Commission uh, followed up on last year's aerial survey um, and, um, and we flew the site again and did another ground survey. 
And we can see from comparing the photos that this year's larch have continued to suffer from the drought and look rather grey, as you can see in the um, bottom right pitch with the red circles. Um, it, suggesting that they've not flushed properly or, or, or have died. So the ground survey found that the larch trees had failed to flush properly. Uh, they hadn't died um, and this was most likely due to drought stress. The pictures show the, the poor health of the crowns. Um, they have flushed, but the needles that are chlorotic or yellow are of poor length um, and are sparse. From the drought damage and stress caused in 22 and likely from the drought early this growing season, we have observed larch with drought damage across the southwest. Um, drought stress can predispose trees to pests and diseases. So plants are damaged directly and indirectly. Direct damage is from desiccation of foliage, buds, bark and roots, and the indirect harm is the reduction of photosynthesis, which affects the plant's growth and the, re and the production of uh, chem uh, defensive chemicals. In conifers, this includes uh, reduced production of resin. Now that's important as the reduced pressure of resin increases their susceptibility to bark beetles. And this is what we've observed in this year's large surveys. The photo here shows the damage caused by drought and by ipsembrae. So from the ground, we find that the trees had been highly stressed due to drought and subsequent ips infestation had further weakened the trees. What was concerning is that this finding of the larch beetle is one of the furthest southwest we have seen. Uh, typically, we've been seeing it in the forest of Dean or in uh, in the Wiltshire area. Um, so the, the, and this one was uh, west of of Exeter. Um, so it just shows that maybe the beetle is is hanging around and waiting for this this stress to happen. Um, and of course, in the southwest, we're normally lucky to have lots of rain, um, but we didn't last year. The bark beetles, such as Ips topographus, not only benefit from trees that are stressed due to drought but also from the hot sunny days that usually occur during a drought as the beetles can travel further. Ips topographus, the eight toothed spruce bark beetle, will walk between trees, but when conditions are right, such as a hot and sunny day, it provides them the ability to fly and thus spread to further stands of their host species. So therefore the, the stress and the uh, uh, they're therefore, sorry, the, the trees and the beetles are affected by drought and heat as these factors lower the tree resistance and increase the beetle dispersal. Oh, apologies. In the same wooded valley where the drought stressed and ipsembra infested larch are, we have observed drought in broadleaf too. Uh, this is quite a striking photo uh, of an oak woodland. Um, uh, just further east in that same valley. The picture was taken in August 22 and the effect of that summer's drought can clearly be seen on the oak trees, which are mainly on the ridges where the soil is thinner. The oak here are uh, sessile oak. Uh, they're old coppice stools that were last coppiced about 80 to 100 years ago. The soil is acidic, poor nutrient, uh, very shallow, uh, and uh, it has minor tree species that include rowan and birch um, and bilberry is one of the, the dominant um, uh, ground vegetation uh, on the on the top of the, the ridge there. And you can see from this photo it's, it's very extensive. The larch in the bottom left of the photo is also suffering with drought as well, um, but we can see the ridges further down the valley um, are, are browning. So a follow-up survey in May this year showed defoliated and possibly dead or die back oak in the same area of the 22 drought stress, which can be seen in the uh, bottom right photo. It looks like some may have recovered as the extent of the browning compared to the grey defoliated oak in the picture below is reduced in size. We flew the site again in July 
and it clearly shows that these trees had failed to flush or had died back. A ground survey of the area revealed the oak in the aerial photos had died back in the crown. The die back in the crowns ranged from full crown death with only new epicormic or stress response growth on the main stem and on the lower branches. And there was branch die back as well in the crown, um, which also was showing um, uh, epicormic growth, uh, the stress response. The leaves, the epicormic growth, it's most, mostly healthy looking, um, apart from some lower growth, which had minor powdery mildew. And I sampled the three branches from three different trees to have a look at what was going on underneath the bark. And all had die back and, clothed, uh, and showed a clear live dead junction under the bark. Now that, that live dead junction is, um, if I refer to the picture on the right hand side there, um, you can see where there's the, um, the healthy white uh, tissue living tissue and then the, and then the brown there that's underneath the bark is is the dead tissue so that's our live dead junction um that branch was over two and a half meters of dead wood um and you can see on that photo on the left hand side it still had last year's leaves still attached this suggests the branch had significant dieback in a very short period between august 22 and may 23 with uh, which obviously includes a period of senescence over winter that most likely began in early November. The ground vegetation um, is in a fair condition compa compared to last year's visit. However, there were areas where bilberry has died with some regrowth. Now, Cesar Oak is adapted to hilly regions with moderate water availability, but it is vulnerable to extreme and prolonged droughts that can affect its growth, physiology and survival. Oak trees can become vulnerable to intense and prolonged drought because they do not close their stomata, which are the tiny openings on the leaves that allow for gas exchange. Stomata also control the loss of water from the leaves, which is carried by xylem vessels from the roots. When water is scarce, the xylem vessels become blocked by air bubbles, which prevent water transport and cause wilting and death. This is called xylem cavitation. Conifer trees, on the other hand, have a different strategy. They close their stomata when water is low, which reduces water loss and prevents xylem cavitation. This is called isohydric behaviour. Oak trees have anisohydric behaviour, which means they keep their stomata open even when water is low. You might wonder why oak trees do this. Well, there are some advantages to keeping the stomata open. For example, it allows them to, to um, maintain high photosynthetic rates. Uh, and carbon uptake, which are important for growth and survival. It also helps them avoid oxygen deficiency in the roots, which can be harmful for respiration and nutrient uptake. The oak trees at this site are on a shallow or on shallow soils on a steep hillside, which already limits their water availability and growth. The intense droughts of last year and this spring has likely pushed them beyond their tolerance and that's what's called xylem cavitation. Uh, so just um, the, the topics that I've covered there, uh, basically you can find really good symptoms guides and um, information uh, on the forest research uh, website. Um, and you can also report findings there to uh, tree alert. Um, uh, I, just before I, I end, I'm going to show a short piece um, here that highlights what we can do to protect trees. So I, I've been asked in the past about what can I do to help the health of a tree? Well, we are foresters and there is no such thing as a tree doctor. But what we can do is create and protect resilient woodlands by allowing trees to grow in the right places and thrive in the right environment. 
We can inspect and regulate timber and wood products at ports, for example. Global trade is one of the main ways that tree pests and diseases can spread all over the world. We can carry out effective biosecurity measures, such as just washing your boots and your tools before moving to, to another site. We survey for pests and diseases to identify concerns so that they can be reported and managed. We can prevent infection by using silver cultural practices, such as how and when we manage the forest. For Dothostroma needle blight on pimer species, it has been found that infection can be lower in heavier thin stands of pine compared to unthin stands of pine. The heavier thinning, such as the voto in this case, where it's pretty open, um, reduces the disease intensity and increases the growth of the trees. It increases airflow and creates a drier microclimate around the trees, making conditions more hostile for the pathogen. We can prevent infection from heteroposidium fungus, which is one of the most economically important forest pathogens in mainland Europe and North America, by using urea, which is a uh, type of fertilizer, on cut stumps. We can introduce natural predators of tree pests to bring down populations to manageable levels, like the predator rhizophagus, shown in the bottom photo here, um, of the spruce bark beetle. And that can reduce populations of the spruce bark beetle in a Sitka spruce stand down to 80%, and brings it down to a manageable level. Some types of pathogens can even be weakened by using natural viral diseases of a pathogen. Hypervirulence of Cryphonectria parasitica, which is sweet chestnut blight, weakens and slows down chestnut blight disease by reducing the virulence of the fungus. We can manage pests and diseases by felling infected trees to prevent further infection and distribution and reduce their populations. We can make attempts to eradicate, such as its topographers, with the use of traps and grey squirrels, maybe. Or we can live in hope. Or we can research for tolerant or resistant genotypes of tree species. But not all pests and diseases are a problem. Native pests and diseases in a natural environment are all part of the natural processes in the forest, which contribute to a healthy ecosystem. So we can all play our part in ensuring our forests and woodlands are healthy and resilient. Thanks for listening. Lovely. Thank you, John. Really interesting presentation. Always great when there's lots of pictures to have a look at and surprising, you know, how drought is affecting our woodlands. Yeah, uh, thanks, Pauline. Yes. Again, just a reminder, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll go through them later. Next, we're off to John Burgess, and I will hand you over now. Thanks, Polly. Hopefully you can see my screen and hear me. No. Yep. Yep. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you, John. Um, we're doing a bit of a double act today. John being the sort of the bad cop who's just filled you full of fear. And hopefully I can now in my half an hour give you some hope. Um, I'm going to expand quite a lot on the things that John was talking about right at the end there, the actions that we can take as foresters that will help make our woods healthier in the future. I'm going to touch on some of the key concepts of resilience, give you a few facts and figures. Think about some tools that help you make a species choice. And then think about how we use those species on site in mixtures and I'm going to try and do that within half an hour. It's going to be a pretty, pretty much of a sort of a, a whistle stop tour um, through. So first of all, the concept of resilience. It's not a it's not a defined definite thing. What it is is not resistance. We are looking for trees that are resistant to ash dieback, but it's going to take a long time to find them. What we are seeing is trees that are resilient, that that are bouncing back after a disturbance. That disturbance might be drought, it might be a pest and disease, it might be a flood. 
but it's that time that uh, something takes to return to its natural state to recover um, that is resilience in its very essence. Um, we got to think about what is resilient. So is it the tree population in itself or is it the woodland as a whole? So could we lose one species but still have a resilient woodland? Yes, we could if that species only made up 10 percent. Species uh, themselves can be resilient, but when we think about the, the population of ash, we are seeing resilience to ash dieback. But what we are also seeing is the loss of ash woodlands as 95% of the trees die. But that is a resilient population because there are individuals that have the genetic uh, resilience, resistance to ash dieback that we can breed from and uh, reforest the landscape with ash but it's going to take centuries and we have lost the woodland so so ash woodlands are not resilient to ash dieback but the ash tree is so there's resilience is used as a term but it's used to blanket and we really need to start dialing in on on what so i'm going to be talking about resilience of woodlands that's the woodland ecosystem that's the natural capital that the woodlands provide rather than individual tree resilience or resistance. Now, we've plenty of publications out there that I would guide you to, and this is the best of all. Um, there's a snapshot here which looks at the main risks. So John's touched on pest and diseases and drought, but there are plenty of others, wildfire, wind throw, storms are going to be, become uh, more intense and more frequent. So a range of risks and then the measures that we can take down the side um, and the dark green dots are the ones that are that action is likely to help reduce the risk the the hollow circles are sort of a may if we take other things and and the cross is ones that just we won't help i'm going to focus on the top three increasing species diversity mixing those species together and then diversifying the structure within a woodland. These are three things that are, are really known to be, at this, with the information we have now, the best that we can do to help mitigate those risks. So John's sort of touched a lot on disease. Here's another one, just but think about the disease cycle. Many diseases prefer a specific host. Once a tree is infected, those spores will build up, and there is then a cycle as the leaves fall to the floor, such as this horse chestnut suffering from Camararia oridella. The the leaves, uh, the host to the to the to the larva. Then the moths uh, at the end of the year fly. They'll lay their eggs in in uh, next year in the leaf litter, and and so that cycle within a woodland just repeats and repeats. And once it's in there, it's really really hard to break that cycle. In a monoculture. It's just going to keep happening. There is nothing. But in a mixed stand, we can create species fire breaks between it. So maybe we could remove one or two of the diseased trees, reduce the burden. The, uh, the, the pests themselves will find it harder to find a host tree. And that's uh, part of the concept of, of resilience here. There's a term we use as functional redundancy. Now, that is where one tree species mimics the habitat niche of another. If we were to lose a diseased tree from a mixed woodland, there would be another tree species that can fill that habitat niche. That is, one of those species can become redundant, but the function is still there. And that is the essence of a mixed species stand for diversity. So species diversity can clearly help, but how are we doing? in the UK at the moment. We're planting new woods, which is fantastic. Um, last planting season, this is 2023, um, so last, last spring, last winter and spring, we planted 93% broadleaf, 7% conifer forests. Now that adds to our existing woodland cover, which is the bottom part of the slide, so we have 75% broadleaf, 25% conifer. The conifers clustered into big productive forests such as Kielder in the north, Thetford, 
uh, some of the spruce forests on, on Dartmoor. So we have a decreasing diversity in the UK with our current planting mixtures, because that 74% broadleaf will be coming higher. We have increasingly non-diverse forests. The broadleaf tree species, six species make up 77% of the total. Two species of oak, one of ash, one of beech, one of sycamore. Each of those tree species has known problems. So is this, is this good or bad? Is this resilient? Well, only time will actually tell. But for me, where I sit, I feel a little uncomfortable looking at that slide. I would prefer the pendulum to swing a little bit more to a balanced position where we have more species, where we're using more species. But what's really important is the trees we use are healthy. Healthier trees are naturally more resilient to the impacts, whatever that impact will be, a drought, a new pest, a flood, a storm. So I'm going to talk now about choosing a species that is site adaptive, because too often we just take a native mix of, of oh, I'll just have 60% oak and I'll bung in a bit of beech and a bit of field maple. And we plant that same mixture wherever we go. Now that just logically isn't right because we have such a diversity of soils in the UK. So when you're looking for a tree species on a woodland creation site, on a blank slate, how do you think about doing it? So there's some tips. Look around, see what's growing healthily in your local uh, woodlands. But also look in the hedges. Hedges are great places, particularly some ancient ones, because they have such species diversity and there might be things in there that you just wouldn't normally consider that might help you expand the bubble of uh, species that you'll use. Um, there could be things in the hedgerow that if they were allowed to grow up will become trees. So lime, wild service, witch elm, all, all good trees and, and helps help divert. are open to the public. Um, plenty of other open woodlands there just to go and have a wander around that are on similar soils. Speak to local Sorry, John's frozen there. We'll um, just give him a couple of seconds, see if he comes back. John, could you just go back a couple of lines? You froze. OK, can you hear me again now? Yes. OK, um, so where, where was the last, last before I froze? Sorry about that. Uh, about looking at your ancient hedges and see what's growing in well in there. OK, so yeah, so the species in the hedgerow that can become uh, proper trees. I regularly see field maple, witch elm, um, white beam, all good trees. Go and look at other woodlands around that are open to the public. Go and join local forestry groups for, for visits to private estates that might not be open to the public and ask the people. Ask your tree nurseries. They'll have a good handle on your locality. Speak to your forestry commission woodland officer and then do some desk based research. And that's where I'm going to give you some tips now. Here's a list of online tree tools. That's um, really useful. I'm not going to go into anything other than the very first one. Um, but hopefully we can circulate um, some of the links afterwards and also then learn about the tree species. The bottom two links um, for the tree species that we we're bringing over into the UK um, and just really understand them in the home ranges to see if they're going to be appropriate when we bring them over, if we bring them over into the UK. But the top one, ESC, the Ecological Site, Site Classification Tool, free online tool published by Forest Research. How do you find it? Search for ESC space DSS, Ecological Site Classification Decision Support System. That'll just bring up this off Google. The next link is how to access. Click on that, that'll open it. And also look at the bottom, there's some really useful explanation videos that were recorded when um, ESC was, was released. So please, I'm not going to really show you much how to use it, but those videos are fantastic. 
it looks like this when you open it, you put in either a dot on the map or you put in a grid reference at the top and it comes up with some default soils at the bottom and also then draws in our knowledge of uh, the rainfall in that area, the length of the growing season, the wind speed, all things that are really useful for species choice. But I have to say here, you must, must, must undertake a soil and a vegetation survey and input them in those two drop down boxes on the left. Do not rely on the default soils. They can, they're right about 70% of the time. But if you're in one of those 30%, you'll end up with, with completely wrong tree species without doing that ground work, that ground truthing to make sure it's appropriate. So when you put that dot on the map, you bring up a list of tree species. Um, I've selected the ones here, which are the green dots, but I would strongly recommend you use the alternative view, which is a numerical system, because each of those green dots covers about 25% suitability. So the light green dot could be anything from 51 to 75% suitable. But it just gives you a starting point to think about which tree species will be useful. Um, it tells you the first, there's two columns here. One, the first column is ecological suitability. Will that tree grow? The second one is timber suitability. Will it grow good timber? And there are 62 species on ESC. That's most of the natives and all our principal timber species. But ESC does something else which is really, really useful. You've got to get your species choice healthy and site adapted today, but also in the future. Just under the, the soil inputs, there are um, drop down boxes. If you click that little options plus minus, it brings up the ability to look into the future climate predictions. The baseline is the data from 1960 to 1990. We're actually closer to 2050 data. So use the 2050 as a baseline. And then you've got the 2080 predictions, which are really interesting. I'm going to look at one sample site to show how that changes from 1990, 2050, 2080. This is for Thetford Forest in East Anglia. Now, if we take the baseline, we've got a range of species that can grow and a range that can't. It's a very infertile, sandy soil, very cold winters, very dry summers on the sand. 2050, there's a lot of species that are suddenly falling out. 2080 is a very, very scary picture. Now, I've picked Thetford because it was a hard site for the early foresters to establish. They settled on Corsic and Pine, which was the, the only tree they could really get to grow. But now with the impact of red band needle blight, it's made the production, um, uh, the, the growth of Corsican and Pine uh, really hard and, and, and massively reduced. And they've been attempting to diversify the stand over the last 15 years. It's, it was hard back when the forest was planted, it's becoming harder, but they're trying new species, they're having some successes and we're learning as an industry from the successes of the guys in, in Thetford. So, so fingers crossed for them. There are species and they are, and they are managing to create a resilient woodland as a whole, despite the predictions um, of what might happen. We've planted a healthy tree, but the really a crucial thing is actually to keep those trees growing against the range of things that want to kill our trees. Picture of a deer, that's, yeah, wherever you plant a tree, you need deer protection. Fence, tree tube. Weed control. Um, the weed competition is, is incredible. So even if we've got a really great species, if we forget to do these basic silver cultural things, we're, we're just, yeah, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Trees do die, so beat up any gaps. We normally see sort of 10 to 15 percent losses of, of our planted stock. Now that's fine, but we've got to learn from that. Why did those trees fail? John's touched on some um, reasons why it might have been, but there are plenty of others. If we learn why our trees have failed and then respond with a different tree species, we end up diversifying the, our planting stock, which is fantastic. Now we often get asked about watering of trees and I just wanted to put in a little few comments about that. If you've planted trees and a drought comes and your trees die, I'm going to be pretty brutal here and say you've picked the wrong tree. You haven't done your research. You haven't assessed the drought 
prone nature of those soils. We have had sites that have restock sites, trees planted six months ago that survive those droughts we've had so far. But they are based on good ground preparation, good research on species choice, good planting, good aftercare. It's that care, it's that attention to detail that makes the difference when we are up against the challenges that John's been outlining in the first half of this webinar. Now, we've got species, we've looked around, we've done this, we've got a list of species, but if we can mix them together, that enhances the resilience. And going back to that guide, here's a snapshot, the line for uh, reducing the most range of the risks that we are facing is to plant trees in mixtures. Now, that's not easy. That's not something we have generally done in this country over the last couple of, uh, of, of decades. We've become better at it, but we had a period of time where we only planted productive monocultures and we need to learn the lessons of the past. How do we know what's a good mixture? How do we know if we've got too many species? Because the woodland does need some kind of structure. Uh, and that's what I'm going to just talk on now for a little bit. If we get the species mixture wrong, we can end up with some trees out competing the others and a mixture that will not be sustainable. Now, this is a sort of a classic textbook image of that, that most of the anyone who's done a forestry course will, will sort of recognize a dominant tree and a subdominant tree and a suppressed tree and a wolf tree and a, a whole range of different terms. But I just use the snapshot here to if those species are growing together, we've got four, three, four different species here that all seem quite happy. If the understory trees are shade tolerant, then they'll just be quite happy to sit in the understory. But if those trees that are in the understory are where where are our principal tree were meant to be in the canopy and are being shaded out by a faster growing tree uh, that, that either we planted or is naturally regenerated, then those trees will succumb to the shade and will eventually peter out and die. And that is not a sustainable mixture. And that's the really important part of, of getting a good mixture, one that will, will remain consistent through time. So one tool back to ESC on the top, Rather than going for a single tree species, we can actually choose the NVC type, which is the second option on the drop down list. Hopefully people are familiar with NVC. It stands for the nat uh, Natural Vegetation Classification System. So some work was done. It grouped all the existing woodland types we have in this country and looked at the compositions. Now, these are mixtures of trees that have survived the test of time. Uh, and that are site adapted because there are there are maps. So we can use them as a really good starting point. When you run ESC with the NVC, you see this. So it's the, the NVC types in a list rather than species type and those dots that are uh, the indicator as to whether they, they will be good or not. And it's the first column, that the suitability that tells us whether it's a good mix. So here we've got three dark green dots, one for W8, one for W9, one for W12. And I'm going to go into just look at one of those in a little bit more detail, which is W12. So there's a map from the old guy, which is bulletin 112, creating new native woodlands. Um, still really, really good read, even though it's, it's sort of showing its age now. Um, and it links and it talks about planting uh, new native woodlands that match the NVC type. Well, here's a map. If you're in the southeast of England or East Anglia, uh, W12 shows up. It's great. But look, at, let's look at the species. It's a beech ash woodland. Now, when we run the 2080 predictions for beech in southeast of England, it doesn't have a future. Drought will knock out beech in the southeast of England. It, it needs its its climate envelope is moving north. Ash, well, only a very, very brave person would plant ash nowadays as the principal structure. So looking back to some of the NVC types, they are going to disappear. Our ecology is going to need to change because where we were seeing W12 woodlands, they are just not viable in them anymore. They're just not sustainable into the future. So if we plant woodlands with native species, 
we are restricting ourselves to a palette of 30 people. It's like trying to paint a masterpiece like the Mona Lisa with a very limited range of trees, of paints, of colours that we can use. The world has 73,000 species of tree that we could use. Just going to just 30 or 73,000. Do we want to stick to native species or do we want resilient, future-proof woodlands? Now, of that, uh, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek with this slide, of that 73,000, not all of them are going to be suitable. Some are just tropics that will just die with the first frost. Some would grow but not thrive. Think of the trouble the Victorians went to to get orange trees to, to, to fruit and to be healthy. A tiny, tiny handful would become aggressively invasive and we do not want to introduce those. But please don't, don't conflate the term invasive with a tree that can set viable seed. That just shows that the tree is healthy, it's living out its natural life cycle and it's site adaptive. So of that long list of 73,000 trees, there will be some trees that fulfil the needs that we have of them, that will be suited to our climate, will produce timber, will sequester carbon at faster rates than our natives, will be able to handle the pollution of our cities, will tolerate the salt laden winds of our coasts, will be attractive in bloom, will create delicious fruits and nuts. After all, we've we've wholeheartedly adopted apple trees, and we think of them as native, but they're not. They came from they came from the um, sort of Kazakhstan originally. But we can adopt and adapt and enjoy non-native species. Now, I'm just going to linger on this uh, concept for 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 a moment longer, if you'll allow me. There are some assumptions made about native versus naturalized versus near natives and neophytes. Neophytes being being new species. Non-natives are less good for biodiversity. Well, the species, if you create a list of trees based on the ability to, to support biodiversity, the trees that appear at the top are the ones that are longest lived and also the ones that are most common. Now, when ecologists go out and search for rare lichens, for rare bugs and beasties, where are they most likely to find them? The trees that are in our landscape and the trees that are most numerous. This is called confirmation bias. If we actually start to add in the trees that we have knowledge about, Norway spruce, for example, appears about halfway down the list of our native species. So it's just simply not true that non-native means bad for biodiversity. We just need to understand what species we want to support and then bring trees in that will fit that environment. Sycamore. Fantastic replacement for the lichens that only used to grow on our elm or our ash. If we knock out sycamore, we are losing rare lichens. If we import non natives, we'll bring pests and diseases. Well, if we are bringing the seed and the trees from overseas, then possibly, John touched about the biosecurity and the need to, to inspect to the ports. But if we take the seed from seed orchards of trees that are already in the UK, then there is significantly less risk. We're only moving pests within the UK rather than bringing them in. The last time we knew that there was a significant new pest imported, oak processionary moth was brought in on a native oak tree. So the use of a native or non-native in pest and disease is less relevant. That non-natives are less well adapted to our climate. It's just it's, it's a really difficult because our climate is not what it was and it's changing. So the trees might be adapted when the oak tree that's outside my window that's 100 years old started growing. We had the climate of 100 years ago. How can that be adapted to the climate today, which is drier, it's windier, the rain falls in different patterns? We can, the climate envelope is moving northwards. If we bring the species to where the climate is that they are suited to. This is called assisted migration. It's doing what trees have done naturally for centuries, for millennia. They move as the, as the ice sheets uh, retreat and progress. Trees show genetic adaptation, adaptation to drought and to frost, but not both at the same time. Our trees are adapted to frost, but that's becoming increasingly less common but adaptation to frost means they're less likely to be adapted to drought. 
And here's the picture John showed you. Are our native trees naturally more resilient? Well, no. Here's some oak trees dying of drought. So it's you have to have trees that are adapted to the site. OK, mixtures, I'm going to speed up a little bit now. Um, I'm getting a dirty look from Polly for, for overrunning. Um, if we go back to ESC, there's a really helpful way of looking at uh, at starting some really good mixtures. It's the next one down on that drop box. It's forest development types, FDTs. If we run ESC again, same dot on the map, it will give us a list of FDTs that are suited to the site. But use this with caution. It is using the old baseline climate predictions. You cannot run the FDTs with a 2080 model. We just don't have enough information to do it. It will bring up uh, FDT types that use species that we may not wish to plant. Coarse pine because it's got uh, red band needle blight, ash FDTs with ash dieback. It will throw up possibly beach FDTs because it's based on the NVC types, which I touched on earlier, that are present in our country today. So we need to know how to manage them. And that's what FDTs do. And I'll show you um, one, one type in a minute. I'm going to use the oak as an example. But here on this site, on this map, the, it, it offers us a, a range of, of about 12. The only one I would really go for would might be peduncle oak with hornbeam as a mixture that would be site adapted and suitable. So these are really easy to think about when you've got that blank slate of woodland creation, but we can use these to adapt our existing woodlands, to start to diversify when we have a clear fell, when we take out a small felling coop, when we thin really heavily and underplant, we can do it thinking of future resilience, of changing what we have into what we've got, but it does take silvicultural skill. OK, five minutes. Thanks, Polly. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, one of the flashcards that if you click on that link, it will bring up. I'm going to break it down. It starts with a picture of what that forest looks like mid rotation. And it's really useful because a picture paints a thousand words. Um, you can see the different species of tree. You can see their places in the canopy. And you can also usually these FDT show uh, a snapshot mid rotation. So you can see how it's regenerating. Um, really useful tool for communicating uh, what a forest will look like, should look like, might look like. The next pit part of the uh, of the page talks about the species mixtures that you might wish to use. So this is an oak dominated stand, but it will then have XBLL, long lived broadleaves, and it gives you some species codes. Here we've got beech, sycamore, sweet chestnut, lime, I apologise for the acronyms. There's a lot of data squeezed into these FDTs. So if you need any help sort of decoding them, please contact the Forestry Commission. Uh, my colleagues will help. Oh, and, the, and the FDTs always have 10% minor species, and that just encourages diversity. There's, uh, I'm not going to go through this part now. That's the next part of the card. It's just a manual for how to, to think about managing them, what you might use. On the back of the card, you have this timeline to think about how to manage that woodland from year one to year zero. If you're adapting a woodland, um, then you, you'll have to use your own um, your own knowledge and, and, and wisdom to of how to diversify. But this is starting for a blank slate. But note, it's not talking about or it's called a timeline, it actually bases the interventions on height. So it responds to the growth of the woodland rather than just intervening at 20 years just for the sake of it. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about tools to create new woodland. A lot of talk about natural colonisation versus planting. And people have this image in their head, one good, the other less good. But in terms of creating a resilient forest, using natural regeneration, doesn't come up brilliantly well. It does have a lower cost. It does increase biodiversity because you are, you're creating that sort of scrub and that structural diversity, and it does match the genetics of the site. And it, so it, it does have some positives. However, it also has a number of negatives. You have to have seed uh, sources present. They have to be having mast years when you need them to. They can tend to monocultures. They are at risk from weeds and they are very, very at risk from deer if you don't protect it. So that's why natural generation comes up as a sort of a 50-50. It's a tool. 
Um, just have a look at this fairly complex uh, graph. The dots here show red dots, existing woodland, blue dots, natural colonization, yellow dots are a planted site across a, a, a vector um, taken. This is uh, some, some recent research by uh, Forest Research. What it's showing is that natural colonization of some species fails to occur completely. So there was no oak whatsoever in the samples that they took here on this site. Some species become to dominate. So blackthorn, very large dot because there were a lot of trees there. If you compare that with the planted, you have a much greater variety of species. The species are establishing much more quickly. The dots, again, related to the to the basal area of the tree, the diameter of the tree. So the bigger the dots, the, the healthier the trees were and the faster they're establishing. So planting a woodland increases and captures structural diversity. Natural generation is more random. It may tend to a less resilient woodland. It is a tool to use, not an end in itself. So if we could get that right tree into the right place to be right technique in the right place, I'd be a lot happier. Final slide, um, bar one, is, penultimate slide is talk about provenance. People talk a lot about local provenance, local genetics. Great. However, let's just look back to what that actually means. People might be familiar with the provenance map of the local zones. What you don't get shown is this spread of dots. So for each of the colour, it relates to one of the seed zones and it looks at the growing length and the rainfall. There is no real clustering of the dots because seed zone 40 goes from Yorkshire down to Dorset with the equivalent change of, of growing seasons. Um, seed zone 30, the top of Dartmoor to Exeter, even just 20 miles, the rainfall changes significantly. So you may have seed from a non-local provenance zone that is actually closer to your growing season and rainfall than a local provenance. So really, what I'm trying to say is understand your provenance zones, ask your nurseries. Very final slide. Resilience, implementation, all the things I've been talking about are complex. They require more thought. They require better management. That costs time. That costs money. But do not think of it as anything other than an insurance policy. It is an insurance against catastrophic loss. The wind blowing of an entire forest, a forest fire, a drought. These are things that will destroy an entire forest. If the forest is resilient, we might lose 10 percent, we might lose 20 percent. But can that forest bounce back quickly? Well, a resilient forest will. Now, there are uh, some bits of research out there um, and undertaking better management, we reduce our losses uh, in the increasingly dramatic climate events that are forecasted. Continue to cover, cover forests have higher ecological resistance, which equals higher economic resilience. And research has found that structurally and species diverse forests recover 50% faster than traditional monoculture clear fell models. And they have higher economic outputs as well as higher costs. So it does cost money, but it's an investment in your wood. Thank you. And here's a picture of a lovely resilient wood that I regularly walk through just to thank you for listening, guys. Thank you very much, John. That was a, a whistle stop tour. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to rush you, but uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, right. Now I'm going to hand you over to Beth and Walk and Emma Strong. Oh, we've got a bit of a lag. And you're on mute, both of you. Can you hear us OK? We can hear you now. Screen sharing OK? No. No, OK. But we've got a blank spot. 
Schon ganz schön klein bei unten hier. Bear with us a minute. Any luck there? Yes, we can see yeah. it. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Emma Strong and this is Bethan Walk. We are both working on the Tree Health Pilot. Bethan is working on the policy side of things and I'm working on the delivery side of things. So we're going to talk to you about how we are designing the Tree Health Pilot to inform the future Tree Health Scheme. Bethan's going to start off to give an explanation of how the current scheme and support works. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the um, current support available um, for tree health in uh, countryside stewardship. Um, and then Emma, Emma as, as she's mentioned, will talk you through the tree health pilot. Um, do you want to just um, drop, drop down? Perfect. Um, so in um, countryside um, stewardship, there's grant support for, for tree health. It's quite um, limited and, and simple. Um, it's designed to um, incentivise um, landowners to improve their woodland, um, clear any diseased trees and, and restock. Um, it has two parts. Um, these are mutually exclusive, so you don't need to um, um, have a felling grant to be able to restock. Um, so uh, the removal of trees um, is essentially a felling and clearance grant that includes uh, rhododendron as a as a uh, 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 another species susceptible to phytophthora. Um, the uh, for what's available is um, uh, support for immature larch. Um, affected by Phytophthora remorum, that's large, that's less than 25 years old, so it's quite limited. Earlier this year, it was expanded to include um, Pluvialis or, or Canobii as well, and the species of Douglas fir and Western hemlock. Um, the restocking part of, of the grant um, is is open to anyone who wants to restock after a tree health issue. So, for example, um, you you might want to restock um, after after ash um, doesn't need to have been after you've had an SPHN to deal with your phytophthora. Um, so that that's broadly um, what's available. I'll hand you over to to Emma now, who will talk to you about about the pilot and how we're we're looking to develop this offer. Thanks, Bethan. So what is the tree health pilot? Well, the future tree health scheme aims to reduce the impact of tree pests and diseases and build the resilience of our treescape, which will be delivering against the aims of the woodland resilience strategy, the biosecurity strategy and the agricultural transition strategy. It will replace and improve upon the current uh, countryside stewardship tree health provision. So the tree health pilot is informing the design of this future scheme. And it is currently um, funded by the Farming and Countryside Programme in DEFRA and delivered by a small team within the Forestry Commission. This includes two woodland officers and a plant health officer working on the ground. It's a three year pilot which launched in August 21 and is due to um, finish in August 24. It's small scale, so only in two regions, which are the South East and London and Northwest and West Midlands, so not in the Southwest at the moment, but it will inform the future scheme, which will be rolled out nationally. Um, it's testing new interventions and grant types, including novel payment approaches for some grants. Um, it aims to target a wider breadth of applicants and treescapes, including trees outside of woodlands and not just woodland settings, um, providing more tailored and varied support and improving on the ease and accessibility of the user journey. The ambition is a broadened grant scheme to reduce tree loss and build the resilience of woodlands in the wider treescape. There's a greater range of pests and diseases in the scope, and I'm going to outline these on the next slide. Um, as I said, it's not limited to woodland trees, and we are testing how grants can support other types of tree owners, not just those in commercial forestry. So if I move on to the next slide, I'll talk to you about the pests and diseases that are in scope. 
So there's grant funding and um, support available for Larch with Photophora and Moran. Oak with Oak Procession North, which is an issue in the southeast in London. Um, spruce with Ips Fogrophus, the spruce bark beetle. Ash with Ash dieback. And Sweet Chestnut with either Sweet Chestnut Blight or Photophora and Moran. And what does it include? So there's a new payment approach for felling of larch, and this is to better support our economic sites. Um, we're trying to smooth out some of the difficulties in obtaining contractor quotes as part of an application, and it includes infrastructure costs associated with felling. There's um, an SPHN advice package to support less experienced owners, and this will fund um, the um, as an agent consultation and a biosecurity package. Um, there's biosecurity items to encourage best biosecurity practice, and we are providing support for the proactive felling of spruce in the demarcated zone for Ips topographers, and this will incentivize actions to eradicate this issue. We are providing support for coordinated action on oak processioning moth and ash dieback, and the introduction of maintenance payments in the restocking grant. Yeah, sure. Um, so how are the um, lessons um, being learned? Um, how are we feeding uh, in the outcomes of the pilot into the development of a, of a, of a new grant? Um, so the pilot was launched back in um, 2021 um, and the, the learning from the first year uh, informed uh, changes which we introduced in February this year. Um, the evaluation is being led by Forest Research um, and also involves the University of Gloucestershire, the Silver Foundation and the Tree Council. Um, the evaluation is assessing um, whether and how far objectives are being met um, and the intended outcomes realised. Um, and that's to identify areas where the design of the pilot might be improved um, before moving into a, into a full scheme. Um, in particular, we're kind of uh, looking to assess whether agreement holders um, are achieving the desired um, behaviour changes that we're looking for. Um, the individual grants can be more effectively tailored perhaps to achieve those intended outcomes. Um, um, you know, are, we, are we reaching the right type of agreement holder um, and the locations? Um, of the of the their holdings, for example, um, trying to attract um, people to act who maybe have smaller woodlands or maybe uh, trees outside woodlands. Um, and we also want to assess whether the advice and guidance meets users' needs. Um, and based on the interest and uptake of the pilot, um, we want to see if how how and when that could be um, scaled up. Um, so this is an extensive evaluation framework which is being used to, to steer the, the co-design um, and looking to, to launch it nationally um, from approximately kind of 2025 onwards, but that's very much uh, a date to be to be confirmed. Um, so further information can be found available online. So we've got our scheme manual on the tree health pilot and that bottom link and the current Woodland Tree Health grants available on the top link. Thank you very much for listening. And I think we're going to take some questions at the end. We'll hand over back over to Polly. Lovely. Thank you very much to the both of you. Great overview of the grants and what's happening at the moment. You just stop sharing your screen. We'll move on to a question and answer session. May not have time to read them all out, but uh, the ones that are most interesting or with most votes we'll go for. So if our presenters would like to come back on video, for the time being. John Manning, there we go. 
So we've got a couple of questions. First of all, um, aimed at you, John Manning. So does surveying include all woodlands or just those sites within public forests? It includes all types of woodland um, and it includes private and public forests. I did put in the chat actually about um, just from the aerial surveys that we did last year, we covered 850,000 hectares of woodland uh, just in England. Uh, and the large 16,800 hectares uh, was surveyed of, of private larch stands and the Forest Commission stands of larch that we surveyed last year were 16,200 hectares of larch in the public forest estate. Our surveys, um, we, we do a, a huge variety of different surveys. We have, we have fixed plot surveys uh, where we we're looking for specific pests and diseases and this covers uh, species such as oak, um, sweet chestnut, we've got uh, cherry and elm and birch surveys because we've got various pests and diseases that um, are uh, of concern that are not here yet. So we actually have fixed plot surveys across the country where we're able to um, keep monitoring these, these species to see if anything nasty turns up. And it's the same for conifers as well. Um, but not only that, our, the, in the plant health forestry team, um, we're trained to look for a huge array of pests and diseases. So when we go and survey, for example, a Phytophthora morum survey of larch trees, as we're walking through, we're also picking up on uh, whatever else is going on in those woodlands as well. Um, so we're, and through that, we've actually picked up um pests and diseases that we've we we've, we've never come across before i mean phytophthora pluvialis on western hemlock was found last uh, found 2 years ago we weren't surveying western hemlock we were surveying uh, for another uh, uh, we were surveying another species um and um, and that's picked up um by a plant health uh, forestry manager um, so we're always just being we've always been vigilant um, and looking out for new, new pests and diseases, whatever species in whatever type of woodland and whoever owns that woodland. Thank you. And does European larch have a future part to play in the southwest opposed to Japanese larch or hybrid larch? It's so some there was some research uh, done very, a very long time ago showing that um, European larch was less susceptible, but that is by no means uh, a significant um, sort of uh, level of um, less susceptibility. Uh, I pick up phyt uh, more infected European larch stands every year. I've been doing this now. This is my 11th year of doing surveys for Phytophthora morum and European larch is always picked up. I think there is, um, there's been some bias towards Japanese larch. I think uh, in terms of like the levels of infection we see in that, I think that's because we actually planted more uh, hybrid larch and Japanese larch. So we're going to see more infection in that. Uh, but I do also think personally that um, misidentification between the species of larch trees has led to um, uh, potentially more findings on Japanese larch, where actually they're, they're not Japanese larch, they're actually European larch, um, and it's just misidentification. But I would say that if you were to go ahead and plant uh, European larch in the southwest, um, you know, you do it with a very high risk that they will get phytophthora more. They're by no means um, tolerant to it. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, we'll just scroll down a bit um, and mix it up a bit. Um, so you did touch on this, uh, John Burgess, in yours presentation, but should we source young trees from southern nurseries or even European ones rather than relying on nurseries in northern England and Scotland? Yeah, that's, that's it's a really astute question. Um, when you when I speak to people, they say I'm I'm using a local nursery. And then my next question is, yeah, but where are the trees coming from? 
because a local nursery may be sourcing their seed from the Midlands. Um, I'm based in the southwest of England, so that's you know moving quite a long way north. Or you've used a nursery in, in the Midlands that's taken its seed from, from the, the very north of England, from the Scottish borders. So without knowing where the provenance of the seed has come from, it's yeah, it's really so. So the location of the nursery is is less relevant. It's the genetic origin of the material you're using. Now, on the south coast of England, in the southeast, you look at the climate projections. If they go to a nursery and they are getting seed from a seed orchard in the Midlands, well, they are bringing that seed quite a long way south into a very different climactic zone. If the if they can't find their you know seed that is from their site or, or very nearby. So where you're fa for based with that choice of, do I get seed from further north or do I get seed from genetically further south? Well, all the science points to using your very local provenance or to look south. The worst thing you can do is to look north, which in the south of England is a very, very real problem. Hopefully that answers the question. Another question. If trees move and adapt, why wouldn't they adapt to drought over time if this is becoming more relevant? Yeah. Can I, oh, can I just here. say one can I just say one thing there actually on um trees are adapted to drought. Um and they have strategies in their biology with how they um they deal with with drought. So like I said, in in terms of the oak, they actually keep their stomata open. They continue to um, to photosynthesize, uh, and what happened in in the, the, the oak in my presentation there was that the they ended up having um, xylem cavitation. So the the xylems uh, which carry the water from the roots up to the top of the tree, they got they got uh, the water basically turned to vapor, and that that stopped the water going up to the crown of the tree. Um, and thus that the crowns were then dying. But that is a strategy to keep the tree alive, albeit with then some limbs in the in the tops dying off. Now, we're obviously, a lot of us have maybe forest is here. So we're obviously looking at wanting to have trees that are, um, are in full health all of the time. Um, but it, it, we're looking at natural, a natural environment here and, and, and native trees and this is the way they deal with it so they do have strategies to to deal with um drought but john will probably say you know, pass over to john here but you know that more, some species are more adapted to drought or more tolerant of drought than than others yeah thank you john what my, the answer i was going to come in with there is that if you look at a tree like Scots pine, which appears from the very north of Scotland down to the Mediterranean coast, it's the same species, but it is not the same genetics. If you take a Mediterranean Scots pine and, and one from the Caledonian pine forests and grow them, they would look identical, they would be the same tree, but one is drought resistance because it has adapted for centuries for millennia to a more southerly climate. One is frost adapted. It has, it can deal with snow. It can deal with um, the predators of the things that will eat its seed because they are different from the, um, from the tip to the mass. So, so we have to look at different genetic populations and the flow of those it occurs over time. So our Scottish Scots pine uh, is it has the same DNA as Iberian Scots pine on the west coast of Scotland. On the east coast of Scotland, that came from Ukraine. So we have two different genetic origins, but those species moved from the south to the north. Now they happened over a geological time scale with the retreating of the glaciers. Climate is moving so fast at the moment that tree species now, I'm going to stick with Scots pine. Scots pine doesn't seed until it's about 80 years old to set viable amounts of lots of seed. If we are interested in using uh, the genetics of Scott pine, we have to wait 80 years for a tree that has been selected by today's climate. That's the little bit more drought than we've had in the past, a little bit more uh, deer, pre deer browsing pressure, the little bit more uh, uh, rainfall in the winter. 
It's going to be 80 years before those genetics can then re-express themselves, at which point we might have a, a catastrophic drought in uh, 50 years time, in, in, in 2070, that will knock out a non-drought tolerant Scots pine. So I absolutely hear what people are saying about the can't the genetics of the trees express themselves. Well, they're doing that within ash. Ash dieback resilient trees are in our countryside, but we are losing ash woodlands. Uh, I'm not far from the Mendip Hills, which are ash dominated on the limestone. So the genetic plasticity of the population is allowing the ash, our native ash, to survive. But we are losing woodland after woodland after woodland, hectare after hectare after woodland. By relying on the genetic plasticity of the population, we are losing woodlands. We keep the species fantastic, but we, are, we cannot adapt. The trees cannot adapt to the pace of climate change, to the pace of pests and diseases, which are much more mobile, which are moving north. Um, and just popping up randomly, uh, Phytophthora pluvialis, we have one known case in New Zealand, we have a known case in Canada, the third known case in the world is in Cornwall. How do these things travel? Well, in suitcases, on airplanes, yeah. The, pop, tree genetic populations cannot keep pace. That's, sorry, a very long-winded answer to to that question, but hopefully that's chapter verse on that one. Thank you. Um, what percentage of survey sites in the southwest are showing drought stress? Um, I don't know because I haven't number crunched it yet. It's been me that's been finding these, um, so uh, bear with me, and I can um, I can let let whoever know um, who who wrote that. So okay. Let's move on down. Well, Polly, can I just jump in? Um, someone's yes. put a little, a little note about ash regenerating within seven to 14 years. There's one thing that's also really worth pointing out is we have a very, very fragmented landscape. Those population genetic flows work really well in large scale forests like we have uh, across most of Europe where you have 30, 40 percent canopy cover. We don't have that. Our ancient woodlands are very fragmented, very disconnected. That, that population genetic flow is also a problem in England. When we have more woodlands, when we have 20% canopy cover, those process, those natural processes might be kick-started. But they just, they're, they're, yeah, they're trying to do that with one hand tied behind their back as well. So, yeah, just wanted to, seems like a, a, a logical flow through to that question. Sorry for interrupting. With with ESC, what are we currently using? Um, it says to use the 2050 climate scenario, but what do FC recommend? Yeah, I'd I'd recommend looking at the the baseline data, which is is really robust. It's uh, yeah, it, it's what we know the trees are definitely doing. 2050 is a prediction, but we are on track to hit pretty much the 2050 climate projections, uh, the way the climate is warming. So so I would look at both. Uh, and if and if a tree f is falling out by 2050, then probably don't use it. Which potential non-natives are considered potentially invasive in the UK? Yeah, thank you. I, I had actually I just uh, typed in an answer to that. So there's there's one that absolutely do not use under any circumstances, and that's the tree of heaven, um, Elanthus. Um, it's yeah, it's just a nasty tree. If if we look, there there can be some trees that are um, invasive on certain habitat types. So we know, for example, that maritime pine is really good at invading heathland. So I would not advocate planting any type of pine around a heathland because they can very easily spread. And, it, and it's kind of that sort of thinking that, you know, you, are, you plant one tree in one place, it's not going anywhere, but you plant it in a different place and it can invade its, its surroundings. It can invade ancient woodland. So um, oaks can sort of hybridise with, with the native oaks and that we then water down our own genetics, which we need to protect. So there's no definite answer. I wouldn't just rule out some tree species and rule in others. It's site specific. Thank you. Um, how can non-professionals, so general public, help to identify and report issues 
with tree health? Um, so there is a website, I think it's through Forest Research's website, maybe it's called an observatory um, and it's really good. It's got uh, a PDF on there that shows um, a, a calendar and when you look at that calendar, you can see what pests and diseases you may come across um, at any time of year. Um, and they also have uh, a wide array of um, identification PDFs and booklets that you can buy. Uh, it's, it's really good. And they're teamed up with Forest Research and, and, and with Forest Research, you can um, use a, uh, a sort of system on their on their website called Tree Alert. And um, on that, you can um, uh, raise any uh, any uh, anything suspicious or something that you're worried about on a, on a tree. Um, that report then I uh, just remember to take three photos. You want two of the, the symptoms or whatever it is that you're looking at, and then one that um, sh shows the tree in context or the plant in context. Um, but yeah, when, when you can submit all of that to this web page. That goes to the pathologists and entomologists in um, forest research, the Tree Health Diagnostic Advisory Service, they're called THDAS. And they all they always get back to you. Um, and um, sometimes those reports come to me uh, where the pathologist or entomologist um, I want to you know, want someone to see it in person. So I actually respond to those in the southwest. And I go out and um, and look at them. Recently, I was looking at uh, uh, a um, uh, a pine tree, maritime pine tree, in um, in a garden uh, just outside of Torquay. So yeah, do, and do use it um, because we 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 do respond. Thank you. I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer this, but is there any proposal to update ESC to include a wider array of species? I think they're working on an agroforestry one, but do we know? There's a lot of uh, updates been done to us. So if, if you if you look at what it used to be and what it is now, you know, there are people working on it all the time behind the scenes. The next big update will be a user interface to make it just easier to to get information out of it. But there's this huge amounts of stuff in there that it's only when you start digging. So. We know there is a need for more tree species, but to add a tree species to ESC, we have to know how it does everywhere from the tip of Scotland down to the tip of Cornwall and everywhere in between. So until we have enough information about how those species grow, and that only comes through doing species trials, and species trials take time because we're talking about long-lived organisms here. It's not just, oh, I put it in and it survived five years later, fantastic. No, it, it takes 50 years to sort of see how that tree's grown over a cycle. So, uh, yes, there is there is, is, is a real ambition to, to add tree species, but it's not quick. It's not easy. And ESC is, is being developed and worked on and improved all the time. Thank you. OK, we'll just um, we are running over time slightly, so we'll just go for a few more questions. Another drought question. Should we be designing managing woodlands to avoid planting, replanting upon thin soils, ridges? Uh, very easy question oh. to answer. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah, you I'll, go, I'll, I'll go first, John. You. Um, no, not avoid those places, but just get the right tree for the right site. If you, I mean, it's great that you've identified that you've got a, a drought prone soil. So then respond, respond with good design. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say, John? Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. And yeah, you could and using that mix as well. So like on that site, for example, I you know, we could think maybe some pine there or something like that as well, if you wanted to make it more resilient. The last question, is there research on replacement placement species for commercial civil silviculture after losing larch and Douglas, but primarily for exterior durable timber? Yes, there is. I used to work for forest research and my role was to manage um, and collect data from research sites looking at alternative species. Um, uh, one of them is actually at Western Burt Arboretum and um, it's quite an extensive um, research site there looking at alternative species and you, 
can go to Western Belt Arboretum and actually see these in person. Um, it's quite amazing the amount of different species that are there. But not only that, when I was in forest research, we would also um, reinstate old research um, plots that were created in the early days of forestry. Um, that was quite interesting. We'd go back in looking at novel species that they were researching back in the 60s and the, the, even going back to the, the 40s um, and um, collect data from them again to see if um, well, to, to see if these would be potentially good species for the future. Um, yeah. It is happening. <laughs> and I'll just just throw in because it, the, the question mentioned were durable. Um, one really good timber um, is sweet chestnut, which you know, if, if you're just using it to build fence, sweet chestnut fencing is awesome. Um, really good supplies coming out in the southeast. Um, there is also uh, Rubinia, there's there's been some chat about invasiveness of Rubinia, but if you can get uh, fencing material made from, um, or it is an incredibly durable timber, whether or not we want it growing in this in this country is, we need to be a little bit careful with that one. Um, but the timber is fantastic, no question about that. Lovely, thank you very much. I think that's where we'll end it, unless anybody is there any final points, any of our presenters? Thank you all who attended and a big thank you to our presenters. Very informative webinar. There we go. And we'll wish you all goodbye. And if you have any questions, please contact the Southwest mailbox. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.